All right, welcome back again. So today we're actually going to do some testing. Uh, been playing around with the Lenovo Extreme or ThinkPad Extreme X1 and I've run a lot of different types of software on it. But today I wanted to showcase one in particular that I really enjoy. It's actually called Systems Toolkit or STK. Uh, it's actually by a company called uh, Analytical Graphics Incorporated. This is actually their website. I have pulled up here so if you're interested in the software you can actually go here and get it the great thing about the software is that it's actually free um, the thing is if you decide to use it as a business and you want to utilize some of the plugins and the modules that's kind of when you start paying for it but generally what it's used for is for uh, four-dimensional uh, model modeling and uh, it's it's very interactive you can use it for planning um, either simulated or real-time land sea uh, space maze uh, systems and maneuvers so like I said very powerful software free if you just want to play around with it all you need to do is actually go to their website go to resources and then once you go there you just install it uh, eventually it's gonna ask you some questions you have to set up a profile and if you fill it in they'll actually provide you a key so you'll have access to all of the different things that are actually on the software so what I'm going to do and by the way, right now, on my laptop, the only thing that I'm actually running, with the exception of the sound recorder, which is here, is we're running the resource monitor as well as the task manager. So you can kind of see how this thing performs. Now, don't get me wrong. There is some stuff I have running in the background that gets loaded when my CPU, or to say, when Windows boots up. Uh, but for the most part, I've closed everything else down. You can look over here and see the... Uh, uh, program identifiers, the PIDs, uh, and then you can also see what they're using here. And to be quite honest with you, I'm going to lead this up and we'll jump back and forth and kind of reference it as we launch the software. So once again, this is modeling software. It, it is optimized for OpenCL. And in all actuality, whenever you set the software up, the it does a system check to see if your GPU is optimized for that as well. And it just so happens that the GTX 1050... Uh, TI Max Q that's in this laptop actually is. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and launch the software. Once again, I'm starting from scratch just to kind of show you how it performs. And uh, once again, there is like no, I haven't made any upgrades to this system. So, we are starting uh, with this particular system from scratch the way that I bought it. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a scenario. And, you know, just for time's sake, um, I'm just going to create something fairly quickly. Uh, this right here is just a setup wizard. So if you wanted to set the time to see how long your scenario ran, if you wanted to name it, description, save it in a certain location, this is where you would alter the screen. We're not going to do that right now just because, uh, yeah, I don't really need to. I do have some other scenarios saved, but for now I'm just going to use this one for this purpose. So once it launches, and you'll see it come up very shortly here, you saw a little spike there when I first launched it. Uh, just to show the CPU being utilized, and then um, you'll see the processor, the process rather, right here at the very top. So, you know, it, it does require a bit because it is modeling, but I don't think it's too much for this particular uh, CPU and GPU combination. So, let me minimize this, and I'm going to go ahead and maximize the software. So, once this comes up, uh, very simply, this is what you get. You're able to insert objects into the scenario that you're creating. So, it runs the gambit. If for some reason you wanted to actually insert a place, which is what's currently highlighted, you could say type in uh, Colorado Springs. It'll actually find it on the map and insert that object into your scenario. It'll end up actually on the, the globe. You can actually pick a spot inside of a city if you want. Like I've done Palmer Park, which is a park that's located at the city. And it found it. What it actually does is it uses an overlay of, and I believe it's Google Earth, to uh, in conjunction with this software to find all these places. And then utilizing the information that's contained in Google Earth, it builds your scenario. So you can see a topographical uh, map already. And then you can zoom in, but we'll get into that. But for now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to stick with space, since that's primarily what I use it for anyway. And we're going to insert some satellites. So 
Right now, selected satellites, you notice the selected method actually changed a little bit. There's a standard object database that you can use. So you can create your own, you can import some, um, you can load constellations from various sources, as you can see here. You can use a two line element uh, set file, all kinds of stuff. I and mean, this is one of the reasons why a lot of folks actually use this software because it is a very, very powerful tool. But we're just going to stick with a standard object uh, from the, or excuse me, a standard object from the database. And what this does is it looks at existing satellites that are currently on orbit, some that actually aren't in orbit anymore, but they were launched, and it loads those parameters. So all we need to do is figure out which ones we want to actually load. So for the sake of the day's discrimination, because I actually want, want to show you the graphics, I'm going to stick with primarily uh, geo satellites or geostationary satellites. These are satellites that are located at about 22,000 miles above the surface of the planet. And... They're in an equatorial orbit, so generally when you look down at them, they stay in the same spot because of that distance. It takes them 23 point, uh, or excuse me, 23 hours, 56 minutes to rotate around the surface of the planet. So it just turns with the Earth, uh, and it gives you the advantage of just staying in one place, and in the event that maybe it was a communication satellite, you look up, as long as you're under the footprint, it's there. I'm going to load some geo and stationary and geosynchronous and I'll explain to you what the difference is between the two. So the first thing I'm going to do is load a, a UFO satellite uh, called MIOS. It's uh, the Mobile User Objective System. It's actually a Navy satellite. We'll put that one up there first. And what's happening here is I did a search. These are all the spacecraft and then now I, I click insert and then what this does is it looks at the object, it looks at all the parameters of the object and it just plugs them in. Once again, if you wanted to launch your own spacecraft, you can design everything that you wanted inside of this system, and you can actually do this exact same thing. You can add it to the particular scenario, but for time's sake, we're not doing that. So now that I got a little mules in there, a little Navy, I'm going to put some uh, I'll put some Air Force stuff in there. So let's do the advanced EHF. So this one's a little bit different. Oops, actually I inserted twice, so let me stop this. Yeah, this is one of the things that uh, I've done before. So the insert button just inserts the ones that are here, but because I needed to search, I should have selected this button. So there we go. Now, there are my advanced EHF satellites. And now we'll insert. So now you'll see these models start to load to our scenario. And what happens is they're going to populate over here in the actual scenario when it's finished. So you already see that the mule satellites were loaded previously, and now we're going to run an advanced EHL-4. It'll show up, and then now you will see all the other satellites pop in. That's all we're going to do for now. We're going to jump over to the actual graphic. So this is the 2D graphic. I'm going to show you this first because this is the view that I really don't use as often, but it still is useful. And what it actually does is it shows you... Um, you know, basically you're looking down at the equator at the actual spacecraft. You also get ground tracks here, and you'll notice some of the ground tracks are different, and it's almost, um, actually I almost spoke about this when we were talking about geosynchronous. That is the difference. So the majority of these are st geostationary, which means they stay in one spot, they look down at the Earth, so the ground track is basically a dot for the most part. They're not moving very much, but then you get others that are actually moving a lot more, and they usually move like in a figure eight pattern. They are a little less uh, equatorial because of the inclination, which changes just a bit. And I'll show you that over here. So looking at the 3D graphic, I'll have to pull out here. And by the way, when you do this, the only thing you have to do is middle, uh, click the middle mouse button if you have three, like this track point does. And you can actually just move it around. So you click the middle, you can zoom out and zoom in. And then if you select the left-hand mouse button, you can actually pivot. So, or you can just move it all over the place. But this is what it looks like. And then once again, those are some of the other spacecraft that were in geosynchronous. And you can see that there is, don't necessarily run along the equator. They are inclined. So if we actually go over here, you can see what I'm talking about. So like, for instance, this guy. Let me see who is this. So... I can probably zoom in a little more. Oh, I zoomed in too much. Well, I'm not worried about it because I'm not here to teach orbital mechanics today. It's just to show you the software. So here we go. This is what it looks like when it's actually uh, got models loaded. And what I'm going to do is just click play here. So this will actually run the scenario. 
I don't remember what the actual time interval was, but down here you can look to see how long it would actually run for. And once you click play, it's going to start. So it's simulating everything that will be happening in orbit as the spacecraft goes around the Earth. I've actually used a simulator based on this particular system, and it was actually really neat because it simulated like all types of things that happen in the real world if as the time runs. So whether, you know, the aircraft or excuse me, the spacecraft is going to be in the Earth's shadow, you know, where you have to actually recondition the batteries or you have to discharge them, like all these different things, because once again, this is simulating the actual environment. What I am going to do now is I'm going to slow this down just a little bit because I don't want it to blow through the scenario. And now we're going to jump to models because you can see right now that this is running fairly smoothly. So what I can do is jump to a central body. And in this case, I'll jump to advanced EHF-1. So this is what it looks like. Now, I'm pretty certain this is in the Earth's shadow right now just because of how the model looks. But when I jumped to the uh, actual spacecraft, it basically makes the spacecraft my point of view. So now I can rotate. You saw the sun over there. And eventually you're going to see the focal point of the orbit, which is the Earth. And it's just moving around. So you can see that sometimes the spacecraft will come very close to each other. So you may be able to see one or the other as you can know. Actually, you notice this one is starting to converge. Uh, so maybe eventually we'll see one fly by. But keep in mind, this is space. So there is still a considerable distance between these spacecraft. I can speed it up just a little bit just so you can see. All right, there's the spacecraft still orbiting. And this is actually going extremely fast if you look down here. Okay, so for the most part, you know, it looks to be running fairly smooth. Once again, I only have this software running. I'm going to jump back over to a different body real quick. So let's say we'll jump to the moon. How about that? And then when we jump to the moon, let me look around and see where the Earth is located at. Okay. All right. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Every time I do this, I make it more difficult than it needs to be when it comes to finding the actual Earth. And I notice a little hesitation there. Huh. It's not moving as smoothly as I would like, but that's fine. So, see if I can downsize it just to see if it was hiding. But, uh, okay, there we go. So, there's the Earth. And there's all its orbits. And then I can jump over to, it's probably not going to help very much, but we'll jump over to one of the MULES spacecraft. And you get the same sort of setup. So you get what I'm saying? But for the most part, it appears to be running fairly smoothly. Or fairly smooth, pardon me. And if you look over here, all right, so here's the performance. Um. It really isn't taxing the CPU at all. And then the graphics, uh, this is the Intel uh, integrated graphics card that's not being used because the GPU is what's being used to run the software. But even still, 29%, not bad. And don't get me wrong, you can really tax this thing up once you start adding more and more models. But for the most part, I believe for modeling, this is going to work. I actually think that it actually does a pretty good job. I'm actually going to open up the resource monitor real quick just to kind of show you. Uh, here we go. All right, so there we go. There's your uh, physical memory. And then if we jump over here to our CPU really quick, you'll notice that you know, you've got your uh, eight, <clears throat> pardon me. You have your CPUs and they're running, uh, I'm gonna say they're not really being taxed that much either. Let me scroll down here just to make sure. Uh, no, let me go over here. Okay, so my memory, there's four megs or four gigs in use, and I got about five gigs free. And then let me see, we'll look at the disk, but oh, I am missing something here. Oh, so here you go. So there's your maximum frequency and your CPU usage 19%. So it's not really being taxed at all. I'm curious to see once I start opening up. Uh, you know, multiple programs that require the GPU, you know, what this thing is going to do. I may even do a test um, if somebody puts it down in the comments to see, like, really how I can max this thing out because I have a lot of other software that's loaded uh, on this system, and I will be curious to see if uh, maybe I can overtax it. 
But I'm wondering if maybe I should wait until I start upgrading it to do that. Or maybe I could do it now and then once I upgrade it, compare it and then try it again, I should say, after it's been upgraded. But needless to say, looks like it's running fine. And this is a uh, systems toolkit from AGI. And I think it does well on this particular system. This is the first modeling software that I've loaded. Uh, the only other one I can think of that I'm going to be using, not a whole heck of a lot, but probably in the near future, is something very similar to AutoCAD, if not AutoCAD, because there is a uh, camera cage I need to design to send to a company that's actually going to make it. And uh, then I think that's about it. But if you have any questions about this CPU, the performance, um, you know, really if you have any questions about the software, please feel free to leave that down below. Once again, this is a free, uh, free suite. It's free software. You're welcome to use it. They also have training for the software. So in the event that you're located in PA or you're located out in Colorado and you have time, you can actually go to their classes. Uh, they used to be called boot camp classes, but now they're called certification classes. But you can learn more about how to actually use this software there. And then the other way to do this is they have online training where you can get certified as well. Back when I did it, there were only like two certifications that you could get. Now I believe there are up to three certifications. And then, you know, once you get through the, the actual course, what ends up happening is they send you a scenario that you build. And then you just send it back to them and they grade it. Uh, in the event that there's an issue, like when I first did it, uh, I had to send them the code, but it was really straightforward. They graded that, and then I think that I got a polo in the mail with their like uh, shirt, their emblem on it, STK. It was actually pretty cool, but they had like uh, coffee mugs and pens and all kinds of other stuff. So needless to say, any questions about this test, any questions about software, any questions about the system, or just, you know, stuff that's on my YouTube channel, feel free to leave it down in the comment section and I'll get back to you. Other than that, Agent Fitch signing out.